Uh, good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. Uh, I anticipate some other students may be coming in, but let's go to get started because uh, this is going to be a wonderful presentation, and we want to make sure that we use all the time uh, for this specifically. My name is Manuel Velez. I am the chair of the Chicano Studies Department. Welcome, first of all, and thank you very much for being here. Uh, this event is the first of our annual events that are part of the Chicano Latino Heritage Celebration. Uh, this is a, a series of events that we have throughout the course of the year that we do every year where we invite artists, scholars, activists to come onto campus and to talk about their work, uh, to talk with our students, to answer questions, uh, and ultimately to give our students a more intimate perspective of Chicano art, of the Chicano community, of their experiences and their roles uh, uh, within Chicano community as well. Uh, today I'm very excited uh, because I brought in Tim Hernandez who's going to speak about his book All They Will Call You. Uh, as a Chicano studies professor, my focus has been on Chicano literature and I've been studying Chicano literature uh, I think since as far back as I can remember. And one of the beautiful things that I've noticed as I've been studying Chicano literature is that through the course of the years, the study of Chicano literature has really evolved, it has really grown, and what we're doing now is uh, Chicano scholars are going back and looking for uh, older works from Chicano writers. Uh, and th that work exists in the old newspapers in the Rio Grande Valley, in journals written by Senoras in California and in Nuevo Mexico, in poetry written by Chicanos in uh, Arizona. Our works, our literature, our voices, our stories exist, but for a lot of reasons. Those stories get uh, lost, they disappear into history. Many times our stories aren't considered Chicano or American stories and thus they're not told and ultimately we get lost as well. What I've noticed in the last several years though is that scholars have begun to find that work. So now we're looking for and we're finding the old journals from writers way back in the 1930s, in the 1940s, and the 1950s. And we're starting to realize how much the Chicano experience is a part of the overall American experience as well. I think ultimately no other author in the most recent times has done that more than Tim Hernandez does. Uh, Tim Hernandez has dedicated his work to focusing on the Chicano experience and how that Chicano experience is intertwined within the overall American experience as well. And I think he's doing an amazing job at it. Uh, Tim Hernandez is definitely showing us how the Chicano experience exists in every asset or in every aspect of American culture. And it's wonderful to see this happening. So I'm excited about today. I'm excited to, uh, to see this presentation and to learn more about what Tim Hernandez has learned about uh, the plane crash at Los Gatos Canyon. I'm not going to talk about it because I want Tim and, uh, and his guest Joel to talk about it more specifically. So what I'm going to do is just basically introduce you to Tim, and then I'm going to have Tim take it over from here. Tim Hernandez uh, was born and raised in California's San Joaquin Valley. He's an award-winning poet, novelist, and performer. He's the recipient of the American Book Award for Poetry, the Colorado Book Award for Poetry, the Premio Aslan Literary Prize for Fiction, and the International Latino Book Award for Historical Fiction. His books and research have been featured in the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, CNN, Public Radio International, and National Public Radio. Uh, Hernandez holds a BA from, is that Naroka University? And an MFA from uh, Bennington College. He continues to perform and speak across the United States and internationally, but he divides his time between Fresno and El Paso, Texas, uh, where he is an assistant professor in the MFA program in creative writing at the University of Texas at El Paso. You can find more information about Tim if you're interested at his website, timhernandez.com. Uh, everybody, welcome Tim Hernandez to Mesa Talk. And I know. Uh, Manuel is a humble guy, uh, you know, but uh, many, many years ago when I first began in the mid-90s, when I first began to uh, take myself more serious as a writer, one of the first workshops I took was with Manuel in, um, in San Jose. So he was uh, kind of the, the launching pad, I mean, so gracias, thank you Manuel for, for, uh, for being supportive all these years, appreciate that. Uh, I'm actually going to kick it off. The reason why I'm here and how I got to know about this subject that I'm going to tell you about, uh, and this subject that I spent the last seven years of my life researching, uh, is because of a song. And you know, a lot of the families that I've interviewed, and even back from my from previous book, every time I would ask them for a memory, they always, almost often, uh, almost always, like tie a memory to a song. You know, and how many how many songs do we have, right, that tie us to our past? If you hear a certain song as you're driving, suddenly you're taken back to being 10 years old again and remembering a uh, quinceanera, or you know, your your prima quinceanera, or your your birthday, or something like that, right? We're tied to music, and music has that kind of power. That said. Um, when I first began the research, I started getting phone calls from musicians all around the world, actually, asking um, about this subject that I started to scratch the surface of, all right? Because this was based on a song that had been sung for uh, about 60 years, okay, when I, when I came upon it. 
And, uh, but there was only one musician who contacted me early on and, and uh, wasn't asking of anything, who in fact was saying, what can I do to help? And instantly I said, man, this is a musician that I'd like to align myself with. This is an artist who uh, cares about the people, an artist who cares about the community. I would come to find that he's actually been singing this very song, playing like at Los Gatos, v for for about 50 years. He's been singing it all around the world, carrying this message. So it's really great pride and honor for me to be able to um, bring him here with me today. He's actually a local gentleman, and he's here with his lovely wife, Lauren, a uh, wonderful folk musician who sings all around the world, protest uh, powerful songs and stories. He's going to share with you today. Joel Raphael, kick it off. Thanks, Tim. It's a privilege to be here in support of Tim's work. Tim is an amazing writer, as uh, you already know, or you'll find out when you get your copy of this book. Manuel, your introduction set up this song. You know, I have three songs during uh, Tim's program, and uh, one of them goes in the middle, and the other two go on, on each end, so it's up to me which one. Tim's always given me that choice. And last night it was, it was the other one, but tonight, today it's a song that was taken from a true story, um, a poem written by a guy named uh, Rosario Caldera Salazar. Uh, the poem was called The Illegal, and it was contained in a journal found in a boxcar in Sierra Blanca, Texas, where, where 17 of 18 men that were trapped in that boxcar perished. I found an article about it in 1987. It was a U UPI um, article. It's been in papers all over the country about these men that had died in a boxcar. And I, I wanted to write a song about it. I was uh, already, um, uh, I guess you'd say, a, a follower or a heavily influenced by Woody Guthrie, who had done this kind of thing. And um, I taped it up on my piano, uh, the article, in 1987. And then in 2000, I wrote the song. I had to think about it for a while. And it's a true story, and many of the words come right out of the uh, diary of uh, Rosario Caldera Salazar. It's called, uh, train, it's called uh, Sierra Blanca Massacre. California and 
Tennessee But over on the other side of the border A piece of the sky still belongs to me A piece of the sky still belongs to me These are some words from the victims found inside a boxcar in a small Texas town. Locked from the outside in spite of their plea. Inside was a hundred and thirty degrees. Inside there was a hundred and thirty degrees. Say goodbye to the boys Or drink to my friends like we used to do And now I'm out here way over the line Your friend, the illegal, still misses you Your friend, the illegal, still misses you Goodbye to Laredo When I crossed that big river On the root of a tree I never knew how soon I'd be yearning For the land that I love and my family Some words from the victims found inside a boxcar in a small Texas town. Locked from the outside in spite of their pleas. Inside was a hundred and thirty degrees. Inside was a hundred and thirty degrees. Thank you, Joel. Um, so I'm going to take you back a ways to uh, 1948. How many of you were born in 1948? All of you. Okay, good. <laughs> um, to January 28, 1948. It was a Wednesday morning, about 4.30 in the morning. And a pilot by the name of Frank Atkinson received a phone call from his employer. They said to him, Frankie, today your assignment is going to be, you're going to actually drive down to Burbank. He was living in Long Beach with his wife. You're going to fly to Burbank, California. You're going to board a, a Douglas DC-3 airplane. You're going to fly it down to Oakland. And uh, you're going to pick up 28, reportedly, 28 Mexican nationals. And you're going to fly them from Oakland, California, all the way to El Centro and the San Diego with the Juana border. And Frankie said, okay, sounds good. Uh, I'll be there. And then they said, one thing, though, Frankie, uh, the stewardess who usually goes with you and tends to the passengers, she's, she's sick. She called, she called me sick today. So is there any way your wife, Bobby, would want to come along with you? And we'll pay her. And he says, I can ask her. So he says, honey, you want to come along with me? They're going to pay you. And she says, um, and in fact, I should say, about two weeks before January 28th, just two weeks before, Bobby was on the phone with Frank's sisters, because they're, they're originally all from Rochester, New York. So she was calling home, you know, just uh, talking to the family. She was talking to Frank's sisters just two weeks before that day. And she said to them, because his sister said, aren't you ever worried about Frankie flying all over the place all the time? And she said, if anything were to ever happen to Frankie, I would want to be with him. So on this day, on January 20th, she gets the opportunity. She says, yes, I'll go. So the two drive down to Burbank, and they meet co-pilot by the name of Marion Ewing, who's from Balboa Park, California. And the three board the Douglas DC-3 airplane, and they set sail without any kind of incident. They set sail all the way down to Oakland, California. They land there in Oakland, and just as they were instructed, there on the tarmac waiting for them is immigration officer Frank Chaffin and 28 
Mexicanos, Mexicans, uh, Mexican nationals uh, ready to board the plane. Plane boards, 9.30 in the morning, the plane takes off. Beautiful, clear day, set sail over that beautiful blue, glistening Pacific uh, Bay Area ocean, and then it sails now towards San Diego. It starts to point itself towards San Diego, and what it does is the wings tilt in a little bit, and it starts to set sail over what is known as the Diablo Mountain Range. That is the strip of mountains that separates Fresno County in the San Joaquin Valley from Monterey Bay, Salinas area, so that little strip of mountain there. So as the airplane starts to sail over that strip of mountain, about an hour into the flight, Frank Atkinson sees something that he has seen actually twice before in his life. He sees the red warning light start to blink there in the cockpit. It's right above the cockpit um, pilot's uh, captain's seat. And he sees it. Now, he stays calm, actually, because, like I said, he's seen it twice before. In fact, two times before. See, Frank Atkinson's flown in this specific airplane. It's called a Douglas DC-3, okay? He flew that. He was trained in that airplane, had more than 2,500 hours inside this airplane, and uh, he knew that plane like the back of his hand, like some of us know our cars, you know, or cell phones. And so he, he knew that plane so well. And as he was flying it, what happened twice before was that he actually, the, the left engine or the right engine had blown out two times before, and he, he actually crashed landed that airplane on a single engine. In fact, his sisters told me one time, they said, you know, the legend about Frankie is that he was such a good pilot that one time he was flying over the most treacherous territories known in World War II. It's called the Hump in India and Burma. It was a hump, and it's just bad terrain for pilots. And that he was flying, he was carrying a plane load of fine china, and he crashed landed that airplane on a single engine, and he didn't break one dish. So she said, that's what Frankie was known for. So if there was any pilot you would want on that plane in this instant, it would have been Frank Atkinson. Here he is with his wife. They, this was taken on their wedding day. They weren't even uh, uh, married for one year. This was probably about nine, ten months before they were killed in this plane crash. <clears throat> That's his wife. So, so, um, so Frankie starts to go down the checklist when he sees the light, and he starts to isolate the left engine because the left engine starts to smoke, and he realizes the left engine's going out, so he tells the co-pilot, Mary and Ewan, here's what you're going to do. You're going to help me figure this out and do this and go down the checklist. And they're going, okay, no problem, everything's good. Passengers in the meantime start to smell smoke, and uh, they're looking out the window, and they see the propeller spinning. The left propeller kind of spins to a stop. <laughs> right? Now, these airplanes are actually built to fly on one engine. What happens is that if the propellers face out like this, right, as it's spinning, and an airplane's still going, the engine's broken, and this propeller's still, the airplane starts to do this, starts to spin, because it's catching all the wind, right, it starts to turn. So what they do is they actually hit a button, a giant red button right above the cockpit, they hit it, and it's called feathering the prop. I never knew this. You, you become a, an airplane geek after having this, this kind of research. And the propeller, what it does, is the propeller turns on its side like this. So now it just cuts through the wind, and it flies on this one engine alone. So Frankie does that, and as they're running down the checklist, the unthinkable happens. <coughs> the left wing gets torched off and goes sailing. Eyewitnesses say that the wing looks like a giant feather in the sky, like a big metal feather. There was a young girl named Nancy Gaston who was nine years old and it haunted her for the rest of her life. She said that she looked up in the sky and saw this giant metal thing floating. She said she would try and run one way and it would float this way. She'd run the other way and it would float this way. She never flew in airplanes for the rest of her life. As for the rest of the airplane, it begins to spiral with a big hole in its side. At 5,000 feet, eyewitnesses look up and they see this airplane spiraling. People are now spilling out the side of the hole in the airplane, and a man in red shoulders is standing there looking at it. At 5,000 feet, the airplane starts to make a loud booming noise and starts to spiral, and he sees it coming down at 4,000. He begins to run towards where he thinks the airplane's gonna land. It's on his property, and he's running at 3,000, 2,000 feet. Clothes are spilling now. Documents are flying all over the canyon, 1,000 feet. People are screaming. He hears people screaming until the plane crashes. What the plane does is it takes a nosedive. And everyone, every passenger in that airplane from the tail all the way into the nose, get annihilated into one fiery grave. No one survives. Not one person was spared. <clears throat> what happens next is why I'm here. The um, media called it the worst airplane disaster in California's history at the time. The worst airplane disaster in California's history. Okay? <clears throat> and then the news reports go out all over from coast to coast. From L.A. to New York, Associated Press runs the story everywhere. 
and they named the four American crew members. They even say this much. They say, Pilot Frank Atkinson, age 30, on the radios and the newspapers. Pilot Frank Atkinson, age 30, from Rochester, New York, killed. He was a World War II pilot. His wife, Bobby Lillian Atkinson, age 29, Rochester, New York, was actually a bullying champion in Rochester. Frank Chaffin, an immigration officer from Berkeley, California, was only two months away from retiring. He left behind two sons and a wife, Mary. And co-pilot Marion Ewing from Balboa Park left behind his lovely wife Dorothy and his small toddler son of two years old, all killed in the accident, along with 28 Mexican deportees. Twenty-eight Mexican deportees. So none of the uh, Mexicans who were there <clears throat> killed in that plane crash were mentioned by name. What's worse? What's worse is that the American crew members all get the remains of them. Frank Atkinson and Bobby get put into a train and sent all the way, thousands of miles, all the way across the United States back to Rochester, New York. Their remains go. Mary Ewing's remains go all the way back to Balboa Park. Frank Chaffin's remains go to Berkeley. The families all have funeral services for them. They grieve. They find some closure eventually. The remains of the 28 Mexican passengers were pushed into a mass unmarked grave in, Ke in Fresno, California's Holy Cross Cemetery. At the time, it was, now, it was known as the largest mass grave in California's history. And for the next seven decades, for 70 years, well, we're coming up on the 70th year, those, named, those people who were buried there remained anonymous. No marker, nothing there to identify who was killed and who was buried there. Some of the families back home get notified they were killed, but they don't, they'll never know where they were killed, where their bodies stayed, and why they were never sent back home. Now, Woody Guthrie, all the way on the other side of the East Coast, actually, before I show you Woody's picture, how many of you all know Woody Guthrie? Raise your hand if you know Woody Guthrie. Beautiful, okay. All right, for the rest of you, how many, for those who didn't raise their hand, don't know, how many of you know this song? This land is your land. This land is my land. As he said, what's that? Wonderful. It's a red joke. Okay. Okay. Well, people who are red would understand this because you're American and stuff. Thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. So. Thank you. Appreciate it so much. So this land is your land. People don't know that Woody Guthrie is actually his lyrics. Like he was a pretty, uh, pretty progressive, pretty radical dude. Actually, you know. We all think about that song, we think of elementary school, but what, they, what we don't know generally is that, that that song had other lyrics to it that they didn't teach us in school, right? In that song, This Land Is Your Land, Woody Guthrie writes uh, a lyric that says, um, uh, I saw a sign there, it said no trespassing, and on the other side it didn't say nothing, that side was made for you and me, right? And he was big on names. He wrote a song um, a couple of years before this accident. He wrote a song about a Navy battleship that got sunk and killed all these, um, so, these uh, Navy men at sea. And he wrote a song that lasted 20 minutes long because all he would do is say all of their names. Until his friend Pete Seeger told him, Hey, Woody, why don't you just come up with a chorus instead of making people wait sit there for 20 minutes and listen to all the names? So they did. And in that song, it's called The Sinking of the Good Reuben James, he says in that song, he says, what were their names? Tell me, what were their names? Did you have a friend on the Good Reuben James? Oh, what were their names? So when he hears about this accident, he says, what were their names? And then he writes a poem. How many of you all write poetry? Don't be shy. Don't be mad. Be proud of that. How many of you all write poetry? All of the poets are, in, are introverts. You know, like, not me. Woody Guthrie writes a poem. And in his poem, he attempts to restore the dignity of the passengers, and he assigns them fake names. He actually writes in the poem, Goodbye to my Juan. Goodbye, Rosalita. Adios, mis amigos, Jesus y Maria. You won't have a name when you ride that big airplane. All they will call you will be deportee. Right? And then that poem goes on to exist in obscurity for nine years. Nobody ever hears about it again, really, until a young college student, about 20 years old, in Colorado, sees those words. His name is Martin Hoffman, a young college student. Before I get to Marty, I'm going to show you Woody. There he is. This machine kills fascists. <laughs> Woody Guthrie. <laughs> and Martin Hoffman here is to the right with his friend Jerry Davich. Martin Hoffman was a college student who found those words and he turned it into the song that we all know and love today. And ever since 1957, since this guy recorded that into a, he turned it into a song, 
it's been recorded since by people like Willie Nelson and Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen and Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine and just tons and tons of people. Um, and so this story has existed in the folk music world for, you know, about 60 years. The folk music world has known all about this story. All over the world, they sing it in different languages, this song. In Italy, they have it. In France, they have it. In Australia, they have it. In different languages. Now, I'm, I'm a Chicano who prides myself in knowing his history. But I never knew this story. And most of the Latino community didn't know this story. Except for the families, of course. But no one knew this story. And it was because the folk music world, musicians like Joel Raphael have been playing this song for 50 years all around the world. And in those lyrics, they're singing a message out. They're saying, who are these friends all scattered like dry leaves? Who are these friends all scattered like dry leaves? The radio says they are just deportees. And this song echoes out across time and space till someone like myself, the son and grandson of migrant farm workers, hears that. And suddenly I'm from the same town that has happened. And I happen to be a writer now. And I think to myself, the curiosity pulled me. What, who are they? What were their names? So before I move on and share with you what I discovered, the passengers and who they are, I want to um, invite my friend Joel back up to sing the song, playing my people's gospels. Joel, let's have a round of applause for Joel. Yeah, just a note about Woody is uh, something that my friend Billy Bragg uh, told me when I was in England. That here in the United States, people think of Woody Guthrie as the guy that wrote This Land Is Your Land, which was actually written as a protest song in protest to the song God Bless America, which was a big hit on the radio at the time. And Woody looked around and said, you know, wow, did God bless America? He really wasn't sure because of all of the uh, problems that he saw. But... Um, in any case, uh, if, here in the United States, he's known as the guy that wrote, this land is your land. But in the rest of the world, he is known as the guy with a sign on his guitar that says, this machine kills fascists. <laughs> well, the crops are rolling in. The peaches are rotting. Oranges are filled in their creosote dumps. They're flying us back to the Mexican border to pay all the money and be back again. My father's own father, he waded that river and they took all the money that he made in his life. My brothers and sisters come work in the fruit trees And they rode the trucks till they took down and died Goodbye to my one, goodbye Rosalita, adios mis amigos, Jesus y Maria You won't have a name when you ride the big airplane all they will call you will be deportee. Well, some of us are illegal and others not wanted. Our work contracts out and we have to move on. And it's 600 miles to the Mexican border. Yet you chase us like outlaws, like wrestlers, like thieves. We died in your hills, and we died in your deserts. We died in your valleys, and we died on your plains. We died beneath your trees, and we died in your bushes, both sides of the river. We died just the same. Goodbye to my one, goodbye. Adios, mis amigos, Jesus y Maria. You won't have a name when you ride the big airplane, and all they will call you will be deportee. Well, 
the sky plane caught fire over Los Gatos Canyon. And like a fireball of lightning, it should go our hill. And who are these friends all scattered like dry leaves? The radio said they were just deep for tea. This is the best way we can grow our big orchards. Is this the best way we can grow our good fruit? To fall like dry leaves and rot on your topsoil and be known by no name except deportee. Amigos, Jesus, Maria, you won't have a name when you ride the big airplane. All they will call you will be deportee. All they will call you will be deportee. Probably dozens and dozens of versions of this song. So um, now, as for the passengers, that's what I want to share with you. Uh, the way that you know you would come upon a sort of plane, the way that I came upon it anyways, a plane crash, uh, 60, 70 years later, is you find what you find, as you might imagine, are fragments of stories. You find fragments of you know the airplane. One of the first things I saw was the actual propeller of the airplane. There in Colinga, California, they still kept the propeller parts of that uh, airplane had stayed there for years, but more importantly, also parts of their stories had remained sort of scattered across the landscape. And so when you start to look for this, you have to, you know, this kind of research, you instantly know and automatically know that you're not going to find whole stories. You're going to find anecdotes and pieces of information. And that's how I built the book. That's how the book came together, was in pieces and fragments. And I trust them, and I have to trust that all of us, the readers, people who read it, people who hear the story, that we bring our own experiences to these, uh, to fill in the gaps, right? We bring our own humanity into these stories, and we, we get to sort of see how those gaps are filled. So that's how I have these stories I'm going to share with you. Now, there are too many stories to share. So I'm actually going to let you all pick and decide which story you want to hear. I'm just going to kind of do that by raising a hand, all right? I'm going to, share, I'm going to show you and give you just a brief summary of the four, four of the stories that I'd like to that had four of your options, four of the wonderful, and each one of them is a powerful and beautiful story. I should say this too, the whole subject is obviously, uh, you know, it's tragic and sad, you know. So one of the first things I knew that when I began to search for the families and search for the people who were in this airplane, I knew that what I was searching for would have to be the light. I would have to search for the, the, the beauty in each of their lives. So I, I would ask questions like, what was your favorite memory of your father? And then they would tell me, it was a song. Or, what do you remember most about your brother? Oh, he loved to play baseball. What do you remember, who, who did the, uh, Luis love? A woman named Casimira. You know, so that's what I was looking for. So that's what these stories are all about. And I'm going to flash through them. And then I'm going to actually, I'm going to give you a preview of them. And then we're going to go back and we're going to vote which one you'd like to hear today. Passenger Luis Miranda Cuevas is the man there standing up to the left. He was one of the passengers killed in this plane crash. Wonderful story of, that's actually, well, I won't, I won't bias you. <laughs> but the, Luis is, uh, that's, is a powerful story of love. There's a the love story. That's his girlfriend on the left of him. Her name is Casimira. And she was still alive when I began looking. And she told me this wonderful story of their time together and kind of a funny little secret that they had. It's an interesting story. Passenger Ramon Paredes Gonzalez. Um, he was here, he was a farmer back in um, Guanajuato in, uh, in, in Mexico, and he was actually, uh, he would farm garbanzos and corn, and he was trying to raise money for a well. Him and his compadre Guadalupe came together. They were trying to raise money for, to irrigate their crops, so they came here working so that they could send money back home to start to build the, use the, buy the materials to build a well. So that's what they were doing here. But his is a beautiful story because his is a more like a father and daughter story. His daughter 
Caritina Paredes Murillo was 10 years old when her father was killed. She was only 10 when her father was killed. <laughs> and she, uh, there's on the bottom left is a little speaker. It's a snippet of the interview I did with her, which you can also hear. And then there's the story of Jose Sanchez Valdivia. It's a story of two brothers. Jose Sanchez is to the left there. That's not his brother on the right. That's a friend that nobody could identify anymore, unfortunately. But that's Jose with his friend there. And Jose's brother is the man sitting down here with the brown coat, Sergio Sanchez. And so it's a brother, uh, it's like more like a brother story, but it's also a story about a, a man who dreamed of one day becoming a baseball player in Los Estados Unidos. <coughs> and then the lovely story of the two sisters, Mary Lou and Helen Atkinson, how they remember their brother, the pilot Frank Atkinson, who was home on leave uh, during World War II when he took this photograph. And, uh, and they remember him for being a humorous brother and somebody who treated them more like a father to them and, and did whatever it took to, um, to make sure they were fed and clothed. All right, so we're going to start here. Raise your hand if you'd like to hear the story of Frank Atkinson, the pilot. Okay, raise your hand high, because I need, I need to be able to kind of visually see, because, you know, I'm kind of guessing here, yeah. Okay, one, okay, okay, let's see. Raise your hand if you want to hear the story of the two brothers and the baseball player and baseball dreams and those Estados and those. Oh, wow, okay, higher, higher than that, because I, I need to be sure here. All right, okay, let's see a lot of you. Raise your hand if you want to hear the story of the daughter and her father, Caritina. And, ooh, that's close to the baseball story. I think the baseball story might still have it, maybe. Okay, and then the story of Casimira and uh, Luis Miranda. Wow, that's crazy. Okay, so Casimira. I'm so glad, because that's my favorite story. <laughs> awesome, I get to tell you this one of my favorite stories. So, um... In 2000, so I had been doing the research since 2010 trying to find the families, you know, from, from my cozy little desk in Colorado where I was living part of the time, and then a few years later from my desk in Fresno where I, where I went back home, that's where I'm from. And, you know, I did all the research I possibly could from here in the United States, and at one point I realized I have to go into Mexico because I had so much information on these families. Now, the only kind of thing that I hesitated from the beginning was because I would never actually been in Mexico. Right, except for like Tijuana and Juarez, you know, the frontera. But I'd never actually been in Mexico. I was fourth generation. My, my great-grandfather was born in Zacatecas, and after that, everybody was born in Texas. So, except for me in California. So it was kind of like a little intimidating, but then I was like, there's no other way. So I, in 2015, with funding from my, my uh, where I work, the University of Texas in El Paso, they sent me out to central Mexico to find some of the families. Now, in some cases, I had... Uh, information of the family members and would contact them in advance and let them know I'm coming. In other situations, we didn't. We would just walk up the streets, look for signs that had somehow their names on it, or we go to the church, we knock on the church door and say, do you happen to have records for so-and-so birth certificates? And sometimes they would tell us where the families are at. It was very kind of just piecing it together, knocking on doors, grassroots. But we contacted at one point, we were looking for Luis Miranda Cuevas. And I knew that he lived in a place called Jocotepec, Jalisco. Anybody from Jalisco? Wonderful. Okay, mind you, you're all going to come in here at the very end. All of you are going to, I'm going to recruit all of you as our research assistants in a second, okay? Well, anyways, uh, he was from Jocotepec, okay? This little tiny place by Lake Chapala. So we contacted, we got in contact with a man there by the name of Pedro. Pedro said he was related. He was a cousin, a distant cousin. And he said, if you guys come here to Jocotepec, you and your research team, all you have to do is come to the municipio's office. I work for the municipio. It's like the local government, right? Like the, local, like the town mayor. So he says, come to the municipio's office, I work there, just go to the front desk, ask for Pedro, Miranda, I'm here. All right, great. So we show up, right? We show up with all of our equipment and we're just getting ready to meet Pedro for the first time and he's going to take us to meet the family. We show up, we go to the front desk and we ask the clerk, can we speak with Pedro? We're here to talk with Pedro, Miranda. And they said, who? Pedro, Miranda. Right? Yeah, Pedro, Miranda, yeah. Um, let me make a phone call, she says, and she gets on the phone. Yes, what's going on, Pedro? Pedro, no, see? No, see? See? Well, Pedro no longer works here. We let him go. And I said, are you kidding? We just talked to him like a week or two ago. He was just, sorry, we, you know, we let him go. Well, then we tell him the story, and we say, can you put us in touch with him? And they said, we can't help. We can't give information on, on him. So we say, okay, great. So we walk out the door. Guillermo Ramirez, uh, who's with me, he's actually one of the... He's one of the surviving, he's one of the family members of two of those pastors. He's with me. And he's traveling and he says, well, what do you want to do now? Should we go to the next town? 
I said, no, 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 let's, let's walk around first and let sort of instinct guide us, you know, so you start to walk around the town a little bit, just kind of getting a sense, because this is the space that Luis Miranda Cuevas lived in, and I want to know about it. But walking down the street, Guillermo's like, okay, well, you go do your thing. <laughs> I'll just sit over here at the placita, we're going to have uh, some popcorn and you know, look at the birds and stuff. So, so I'm walking through the town, it's a small town, I'm walking through the town and I see like a beacon in the distance, and it's a giant mural. Thank God for the artists. It's a big mural, okay? And above that mural it says, Centro Cultural de Jocotepec, the cultural center in Jocotepec. And I said, yes, the cultural warriors, they know what's up, you know, they, they keep all the information. So I walked into the building, and they're inside the building, it said Biblioteca, a little sign over there, and I said, oh God, even better, you know, the superheroes with the capes, they live behind those bibliotecas, you know, they're called librarians, you know? <laughs> those are the superheroes, they keep all the information for communities, and I thought, wonderful. I walk in, as soon as I walk in, the librarian says to me, can I help you? Guillermo by then pulls up and he's like, oh, there you are, I've been looking for you, okay? So yeah, come here, come here. So we tell the librarian the story and she says, who's the man's name, what's the man's name? We said, Luis Miranda Cuevas. And she says, hmm, let me make a phone call. Luis, see, si? no, uh -huh. see, si? no, see? Si? Okay, I'm gonna tell you how to find his family. There's a woman named Irene Miranda Navarro. You're gonna go out this door Two streets to make a left, another right, two lefts, another right, two more lefts, and then, be careful, because it's the fiestas, kids got fireworks, they're all over the place, she said. She goes, and then you're gonna find a giant wall, big wall there, and a big metal door, and you have to hit that door real hard and somebody will come out. I said, what's behind the wall? She said, uh, it's an elementary school. A woman named Irene Miranda Navarro, she's the principal, she's related. She's waiting for you guys. We start going right away, <laughs> going to the two rides with the left, what? Okay, we finally get to the big wall. Just like she said, big metal door, and we pound on the door hard, boom, boom, boom. And a little tiny latch opens up, Shh, can I help you? <laughs> like, yeah, we're here to speak with Irene and Miranda Navarro. Hold on, Shh, so we're waiting. A few minutes later, the door opens, the little latch goes, Shh, I'm Irene, can I help you? <laughs> we're the author, we, we tell her, she says, oh yes, yeah, let, me, let me let you in, hang on. Shh, and then she takes five minutes to unlock the big door. <laughs> Open the door. <sighs> come in, guys. Come in, come in, come in. We go in. We sit down in the principal's office. We're all sitting there in little chairs, little kid chairs. <laughs> We're looking at her. And she begins to tell us these wonderful stories about her tío Luis. And, you know, like administrators do, and principals especially, they also got capes on. And, you know, they're, they're multitasking. She's taking phone calls, signing papers as she's telling us these stories, you know. And then in the meantime, too, she's also calling up her cousins. You, you gotta come over here, quick. There's some people who wanna ask about my tío Luis. Come, come, come. So by the time she's done talking to us, there are like 20 family members in this office, and they're all looking at us. And they're all telling us these wonderful stories. And when they're done, she says to me, you have to understand, none of us were alive when Luis was killed, so all these were stories passed on to us from our, our parents. Luis's siblings and relatives, we don't know. So how many of us get that, right? We always hear these stories passed on to us. It's important to keep them and keep passing them on. And she says, so none of us would have known him. And then I said to her, is there anybody who's still alive who might have personally known Luis? No, sorry sir, this is, that whole generation is gone. They're all gone, everybody just looks at each other, no, no. But then a little voice in the back, casi mira still alive. Oh, oh, see, casi mira, no, see? Well, Arturo says that Casimira's alive. Yes, she's alive, Matias, she's alive, yes. I said, who's Casimira? That's a cool name, first of all. Casimira? Man, as a writer, you can't get a better name. I couldn't think of a better name than that. For a character, I was geeking out for a moment because I was like, Casimira, you know, it, the, the translation is almost sees. Casimira, she almost sees. And I was thinking, metaphorically speaking, going, hmm, wow, that's like memory. You can almost kind of see it, but you can't. What a name! So I was like, so who was Casimira? Who was she? And then they said, that was Luis's girlfriend. They were engaged to be married when he was killed. I said, you're kidding me. And Arturo said, everybody, get in my van. Come on, I'll show you where she lives. We all get in the van. We're driving out the cobbled streets to Casimira's house. We get to Casimira's house, beautiful little tiny house with bugambilias everywhere. He says, let me go check my tia, let me go first check my tia's, okay, to take visitors, okay, so he goes in, he comes back out, come on guys, come in, come in, she's here. So we go inside the house like that, and Casimira, oh, there's a door that opens up, and she comes out in a wheelchair. She looks up, and Arturo says, he's very charismatic, he says, tia, listen, tia, 
You're never going to believe this, Tia. He says, you know what these gentlemen are here for, Tia? They want to talk to you about one of your good friends. A very good friend, Tia. A very good friend. <laughs> she goes, she's kind of like had it with him. She's like, okay, who, who is it? And then he says, uh, Luis, before he finishes his name, she says, the one that died in the plane crash? Said, that's the one, Tia. That's the one. Tell him, tell him, tell him. Tell him the story. So she begins to tell us this story of her and Luis. She tells us a lot of stories. Her memory of Luis is vivid. So I'm going to share with you just a small excerpt from that interview. I'm so glad you picked this story. Thank you for doing it. Casimira <laughs> says, <clears throat> Oh, oh, you're going to follow along. All right, nice. Uh, page 38. But you know what? Good luck trying to follow because I skip around. <laughs> Here it goes. Every memory I have with Luis is a good memory. There are so many. We got along very well. I remember this much. And, and I remember we did anything we wanted with him. I mean, well, I did anything I wanted with him. Not like that, not like that, no. <laughs> you see, I would make Luis sew and cook, things like that. Yes, we got along so well. We complimented each other. That I remember very clearly. When we first began, you'll never believe this, when Luis and I first began, I would make him dress up as a woman <laughs> and then sew with me. Believe it or not, this is what we did. Well, do you want to know why we did this? Well, I had him do this because, you see, well, my father would kill us if he saw us together. And my sisters, they would help. We would all sit side by side at a table outside and we would sit down real close and Luis and I would sit in the middle and we would talk, him and I, him with his wig and his dress on, sewing, pretending to sew with me. And we would talk like that, my sisters around us, just so that my father would not see him. We would have to dress Luis up as a woman. And he would do it. That guy. <laughs> He's looking at you like, what? <laughs> yeah, I did it. <laughs> and we would do it. He was adventurous like that. He was adventurous. He was a fun person to be with. And I remember he was willing to dress up like a woman just to get a chance to talk to me, to spend time with me. And that's how we did it. And I'll never forget this one time. And then she goes on to tell me about the time they got caught doing that. That's exactly how it happened, too. Luis didn't last but a few minutes before my father caught on and he chased us. And I remember Luis, he shoved my sisters aside and he ran to hide. We all ran and hid. One sister hid in the baby's crib, another sister, she climbed on top of the bed, and I, I scrambled underneath the bed. My father, he discovered my sister first, the one who was in the crib, and boy, did he let her have it. And then he found my other sister in the bed, and he let her have it too. And then he looked under the bed, and he found me there, and he said to me, I'll never forget, he said to me, get out of there, cara de dolorosa. You see, whenever my father was upset with me, this is the nickname he would call me, he would punish me by calling me cara de dolorosa. You see, well, my father called me this because, well, you, you have to understand, he loved me very much. He never hit me. You want to know why my father never hit me? Well, because, you see, I was named after his own mother, Casimira. My mother would always yell at my father, why don't you hit her too? It's her fault. She's the one with the boy. And my father would reply, I can't because it feels like I'm hitting my own mother. <laughs> I know my name, Casimira, is an ugly name. I know it is, but it worked for me because I never got hit. <laughs> and uh, I don't remember Luis ever being caught. When Casimira spoke, it was clear to me that she was speaking not as an 86-year-old woman, but instead as a young woman, perhaps no older than 20. There was a youthfulness about her eyes that was revealed in them remembering, and she remembered everything. That was her at the same age when she had met Luis and they were together. And that, in fact, that was a photograph she had given him that he would carry with him when he comes to the United States. And uh, I'm going to show you the photograph of her on the day that we met her, and she told us the story. Okay, uh, I'm actually aiming towards the end here. What I want to do is uh, I'm going to leave a little bit of time for some questions, okay? Because uh, um, I'll be happy to talk with you afterwards as well, but um, if you all have any questions, it'd be great so all of us can hear. Um, this is the original photograph uh, taken in 1948 of the funeral services. There were 28 caskets. Most of them had nothing in them. 
on that day before the audit, before the big crowd, only two caskets were interred before the crowd because he said it would have taken about two days to put them all on the ground in front of everybody. All, every person who was here, there were about 500 people on this day who went to this funeral. Every person here, no one, no one knew who those people who were being buried, no one knew who they were. They were anonymous. They were mostly from the migrant farm work in the Mexican community there in Fresno and around the San Joaquin Valley, all the campesinos, the farm workers had come to pay respects to their, their dead brothers and sisters who were left here without family. Some of the newspapers actually report that. The caskets were labeled A to Z. They were buried and uh, the grave remained unmarked. And in fact, it had a small little placard on it and the placard just said uh, 28 Mexican citizens died January 28, 1948 in a plane crash, rest in peace. That's all it said. For 70 years, or actually for about almost 70 years. That's how long it said. And so that's how it looked when I came upon it in 2010. Just that small little stone in front of a large patch of grass. At one point when I confirmed the names of who those passengers were, this was around 2000, it was in 2013 when I confirmed who they were, all their names. I had approached the cemetery at the time and said, what will it take to put a headstone with all their names on it? And they said, permission from the bishop. A man named Carlos Rascon, he's the director there of the cemetery, he said, I, we would need permission from the bishop and we need to raise a lot of money because that would be a big headstone. And I said, yeah, okay. And I was kind of thinking, well, it's not big. It's like maybe this big. And he was like, no, no, no. We need to, let me show you the headstones that we bury the bishops in. <laughs> and it was like a big four by eight piece of granite. So it would be needed to be that big. And that's about $10,000, $11,000 probably. I said, gosh. So he says, uh, so he says you I said to him, well, I'll work on confirming the names. I mean, I'll work on uh, raising the money, and you work on getting permission from the bishop. He says, okay. So then my friend Lance Canada is a wonderful musician from based out of Fresno also who uh, redid the song. He and I actually did the song together with the names in it. Um, he and I began to lead a charge to raise money, and uh, along with the church, they also helped raise money. And then wonderful musicians like Joe Raphael went all around the country talking about this, letting people know to donate. And within four months, we got $14,000 donated from all around the world. The biggest check was $200. So all the money was like from $20 here, $15 there. Children were writing letters saying, here's why we want to do this. Or people who had been singing this song in different languages sent us checks saying, I'm so glad to know that they've finally been found after so long. And, you know, On Labor Day of 2013, we installed the brand new headstone in front of a crowd of 1,000 people. This headstone now at Holy Cross Cemetery it has the um, what happened in that tragedy in Spanish and in English. It has the names of every passenger who was killed on that airplane, including the four American crew members, because erasure at any level, in any community, is wrong. And, uh, and then there are also 32 leaves etched around the stone for Woody Guthrie's lyrics. Who are these friends all scattered like dry leaves? The radio says they are just, you know, these are the names of who they are. And then in this foundation, you actually have, over here you can't see it, but it's actually that small placard where it was anonymous at one point, and now you can see how it went there. Families, that man over there, here I am. The man behind me over there is Jaime Ramirez. It was his grandpa and his tío who were killed in that crash, so he was there. Family members of the pilot and, uh, and the stewardess were there. Martin Hoffman, the musician's family, was there, so a lot of the folks were there. And in fact, I got to take them to see the actual crash site because they had never seen it. There in that tree behind us is where the plane nose dived into, you can't see it, but there's like, that's where, the, that's where the creek is at, behind that tree. And it hit right beneath at the base of that tree. That tree actually caught fire back then, and it's still standing there. It's kind of broken apart, but it's standing there. Larry Haas, it was his grandfather who was first running when he saw that airplane. It was his grandfather who was the first one to respond. It was his family's property that the plane crashed on. Billy Atkinson and Connie Mart are the niece and nephew of the pilot and stewardess. Guadalupe Ramirez. Uh, you know, he's named after his grandfather, Guadalupe, who was killed. Uh, my father, who I'm not named after. <laughs> Guillermo Ramirez and Don Leobardo, who are also related to the uh, two passengers, Guadalupe and Ramon. My friend Diane Vigent, her father was the man playing with Martin Hoffman, the song. My friend Lance Canan is there. Okay. Now here's where you all come in. Here's where I recruit you all. First I'm going to show you. This is the list of names of all the people killed in that accident. This is the list I take around all over the country when I talk about this story and show people. But because I'm here in San Diego, in all of my research, out of all the 32 passengers, I've only found the families of eight. Eight passengers in a search for the last seven years. All of my research tells me that most of the families were between San Diego 
and Sacramento, this whole stretch, most of them. And so I went uh, one time to Stockton, California, and I asked a bunch of folks like yourselves the same thing, showed them the list, and an hour later, someone contacted me and said, I'm related to one of those passengers. So I would bet that it's very possible that maybe one of you might be related. So if you see on this list, these are all the folks yet to be found, the families yet to be found. Okay. If you see a last name in a town tied to a, in Mexico there, and you see one of those last names that looks like yours and your family's from that town, go home and ask your family about this story and your relatives. Because most of us know maybe two generations back our family's story. I mean, we know usually our parents' story. And then we know sometimes our grandparents' story. We hardly ever know our great-grandparents' story. So it's important that we go home and ask, because you might be, you might be tied to this, just like this young lady in Stockton was. A lot from Jalisco, Zacatecas, some uh, from Mexicali, from Tijuana, somebody from Tijuana? Yeah, Tijuana. Bernabe García López. Yeah. I'm going to leave this list up all the way through, so that way as you're filing out and you want to take pictures of it, you're welcome to take pictures of this list also, so you can take it on. Okay, I'm going to take um, a few questions. Yeah, a few questions, and then we're going to close out with one more wonderful song from Joel Raphael. A few questions from the audience, anybody? Well, I just have a comment. I've sung this song many times, because I was a folk singer in the 60s. I never knew the whole story. And I can't. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. And you, sir. Thank you. Anybody have any questions at all? Yes? <clears throat> Why did you choose to include the pilot story when he was like already represented? And, you know, like he wasn't forgotten like the other passengers. Yeah, that's a very important question. I'm glad you asked that. Why did I include not only the pilot story, but also the immigration officer's story is in this book also. I went back and did his genealogy, led him all the way back to the beginning of how his family got here. The pilot story, the stewardess's story. The reason why is because um, there's a big, there's great potential in this story, right? If I were to just take only the Mexican passenger story and only research that and look for that, then, I, then I'm missing the point, right? Because the point is the humanity that links all of us, right? If I just pull the Mexican passengers' stories out and illuminate that, then I'm essentially kind of doing what was already done before, the erasure of a, of a certain sect or a certain group or a certain community. And I didn't want to do that. I felt like if I put the pilot's, the things he loved, the last love letter he wrote to his wife, Bobby, actually, about, uh, there was a, a love letter he wrote to her about a month before they were about to be married. Not even a year before they were killed. He writes a letter to his wife, and it's so beautiful. And there's so many dreams and hopes they're talking about and plans. And then you find the letter of Ramon Paredes Gonzalez, and the letter he writes to his wife, Elisa, in Charco de Pantoja, in Guanajuato, Mexico. He's saying, Elisa, I'm so sorry. I miss you. Please kiss the children for me. Tell them how much I love them. I have spent all of our money. If you have any garbanzo beans left, sell them. You put those two letters side by side, then what you have is the humanity that rides any political uh, you know, ideologies, that rides any kind of social status. All these things get set aside, and what you're talking about is the human beings. That was the most important thing in this whole story. That's why I did that. Tim, also, I think in one presentation I heard you bring up, like, I think it's a sensitive issue for the pilot and his family because um, they were, he was quick to place blame, like, why, you know, and and I think it was a, a kind of a resolution for them, too, that you yeah. describe his experiences and, and that the plane, you know, was just a freak thing. Right. That's right. Uh, what what uh, Lauren Raphael says is that the pilot's family, they were, a lot of the families were very reluctant at first to talk, you know, because on one hand you have a tragedy. Who wants to bring up, who wants to open up an old wound? It's hard to talk about that. But on the other hand, too, there was an issue like with the pilot. When that accident happened, the company, the airline's company, and there were some lawsuits going on, the first thing they tried to do was place blame. So they immediately looked to the captain of that ship, which was Frank Atkinson. And the family actually had to hire attorneys and investigators to, you know, cover the brother's name, you know. And later on, the, the reports finally all came out, the official reports said it was nobody's fault that the engine caught fire. And, you know, there's nothing Frank could have done. In fact, 
he was probably the main man to figure that situation out, and he couldn't. And so the family was concerned when I started asking them questions, and they were asking me, well, what's this book about? And what are you trying to do? And, you know, and, and in the end, the family has been very happy with the portrayal of the brother. Any other questions? Yeah. Is that company out of, um, is that company done with the planes, of those planes? Because then, then these guys can actually come back saying, that was done with Mount Funk. Would they get any restitution for that? You know what, that's a good question. That's, I, don't, I don't know. You know, I, I do know that, I mean, you're talking specifically about the company he worked for or the airplane manufacturer? The airplane manufacturer. Right, Douglas DC-3, you know. Because they, they would be, be a name, that they would get something out of that because that was their fault right, at right. that time. And, you know, at that time, too, I mean, you know, you kind of bring up a good point. And one of the things that was happening, actually, the Douglas DC, there was also a Douglas, this was a Douglas DC-3, there was a Douglas DC-6. And the threes and the sixes during those 40s, because you know you got to imagine these were airplanes that came out of World War II, and there was a surplus of them, so they were trying to use them as much as they could, you know, cargoes and shipping and passengers. They were actually some of the first passenger planes for the Douglas DC-3. Well, what was happening at this time now, after the war and after those planes had been used and abused in the war, uh, a lot of them were crashing. There was just three months before this crash, there was another one that killed 50 something people in Utah. So during uh, 1948, they actually grounded all Douglas DC 3s. And what, what I understood is that, that they kind of broke up, they dissolved the Douglas company, and then you know, the, the manufacturers uh, took on a different name and reshaped the structure and all that. And that's, that's how they. Uh, and actually, the same thing with uh, Frank Atkinson's employer, the company he worked for. They dissolved right after that, and then like, a few months later, they came up as a different name and different company. Did you ever contact INS? What's that? Did you ever contact INS? Because they would have, not that, not that they had documents on the plane, but they also had documents down there too. Yeah, there's a, man, there's a manifest. There's a manifest right. right. Absolutely, there's a manifest. Um, but, you know, I never got any information back from the Department of Labor. Uh, you know, I was applying like FOIA and trying to get more information that way and all that. But uh, the only information that was ever given to me was not um, through the Department of Labor, through INS. The information, in fact, just only came from archives, like, you know, National Archives and uh, even Ancestry.com, and um, you know, there were just different archival records that came to me, and then of course with the family members themselves contributed. Yeah, I never received anything from them. Not even the consulate, the Mexican consulate was very much involved and had a lot of correspondence, and they didn't have any records. In fact, they told me that those records don't exist anymore, so. Any other questions? Yes? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of process, like, can you talk about your process as a, as a writer, like for, for any emerging writers out here, like, Maybe just a little bit about your own process and advice for them. Yeah, you know, um, the, the process for writing, if any of you are interested, um, for writing a subject like this, and even in my last book, which was also kind of like a historical uh, revision, you go back and you find these. The process for me really is like, I don't think about it like in a book form. I don't think to myself, this is going to be a great poem, or this might make a great fictional story. Or I can't think like that, because you don't know what's going to come out of it. You don't know. So all, all you can do is from, the, from day one when you intentionally decide, I'm going to start searching for these names. It may or may not be a book one day. You write everything in your path. Everything. Like, I would write stuff like, you know, I'm going to the canyon today, and I'm this, this is the date, and I'm going to search here and look for this, and this was, and then when I'm done, I write down what I found. I found nothing, or I talked to so-and-so. I write a very, almost a journal entry. But then, when I start meeting families, I'm recording their stories, and then I go home and I transcribe their stories. So now I have a transcript, a transcript of the interview. But what happens when somebody's telling you a story? Our mind starts to concoct that reenactment in our head. So then I allow myself to write the reenactment also. I have a transcription, the reenactment, the information of searching. And then after I do that for about five years, and you have like 500 pages of stuff, then you go, hmm, is this a book? And if it is, what's the story? What do you, you know, how do you put that together? And then it's like a puzzle. You put all those different pieces, the journal, the uh, photographs, the documents, the records, all these on the big, on the floor, and you stand on top of a, your chair in your kitchen and look down at everything and go, okay, what would come first in a story? For me, I needed to put the reader right into the middle of the scene. So I started off with Red running down the dirt road, as his daughters told me, you know, chasing the airplane. And then you start to find a way. And then it's just a matter of finding different combinations for the next few years until you find the right the right approach. That's the only way I can think of to write a book like this. Otherwise, you know, I, I think you'd be missing a lot. So I don't know. Yeah. That's my, my process. Anyway. If you were to find the other passengers that are yet to be found, would you create a second book about their stories? 
I'm going to end it on that question right there, okay? And we're going to bring up Joel to finish this. She asked if I were to find any other passengers, would I continue the book and write their stories? Two, I had only found, when the book was done, I only found seven of 32. Two weeks ago, I was flying out of LAX, and I got a phone call from a woman who said, I'm the cousin of Francisco Duran Llamas. I found out about your book. I've known of this story. I just wish that I was involved sooner so we could have my uncle's story in that book also. And then I had never really thought about that question until she called me. And after we, did, we were done interviewing and talking, I said, man, this is a great story. Man, how can I figure that out? So right now, I'm okay with not trying to figure out what is going to come of it, how that will manifest. My job right now is to record that family story. Because more important than a book, it's history for us. It's history. It's living history. To record that story and then to ask the family to gather photographs, information, documents, records, anything they have, and then to keep it, to make digital copies, to teach the family how to archive their own family's history. That's what I'm working on right now with them. What comes of it, I don't know. Maybe, maybe another book, maybe uh, uh, to play. I don't know. You know, it could be anything. So. Um, yeah, I'll take your, your last question. Go ahead. You're that doing a documentary or maybe a film? That's right. We're working on a documentary um, since about 2011. We had cameras. I've, had, I've been first. It was me with my camera, my digital camera, going around recording the interviews and all that. Later on, videographers would volunteer and say, "I could follow you around with my really nice camera," you know, in case we do that. And pretty soon, and then in Mexico, we had a camera person there again, following us around. And then one day, we just sat down, myself and a few uh, filmmakers from the Basel, sat down and looked at all the footage, and we said, "This is the whole thing is here. It's a documentary." And so now we're editing. We're not filming or shooting anymore. We're just raising money to finish editing. Project. Um, <laughs> all right, last one. Okay, last one, guys. <laughs> what are you going to do with all the raw material? I don't know if you thought that far ahead. The raw, the raw footage, the photographs, the uh, interviews, field notes, all that kind of stuff. All of that will be archived. Will you archive yeah, all that will be. State or what? I don't know where yet. You know, the the Woody Guthrie Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where Woody Guthrie's archives are at. They've actually asked if we can house them there. They have a wonderful facility, the kind that's a vacuum. You know, if like the whole building goes on fire, they like they pull all the air out of it and all the oxygen, so that none of the records get destroyed. That's very enticing to keep all the records in a place like that, where you know they're going to always be, forever. Um, on the other hand, I'm kind of torn about going, you know, if researchers or scholars want to learn about this story, they should come to the San Joaquin Valley where the story is from and breathe the air and see around to find the information. So I don't know yet, but I do know that I'm going to archive them in a place that will keep them for all eternity <laughs> for, and, and make it accessible to people to come out and, and uh, see it and use that story. Yeah. All right, uh, I'm going to thank you all so much, and we're going to actually, before you clap, I'm going to bring up Joel Raphael, and he's going to close us out with a wonderful song. So round of applause for Joel Raphael. Remember to take a picture of this. This last song um, I'm going to do is a song I wrote after I met Tim. Um, I, I went up to the dedication of the uh, headstone, and the night before they had a uh, gathering, like a reception of folks that were going to go to the, uh, the mass that they held, the mariachi mass they held at Holy Cross Cemetery. And um, I, we looked for a seat. It was held at a restaurant called Ole Frioli, which is owned by one of the uh, descendants of uh, two of the victims. And um, we got there and looked for a place to sit down and ended up sitting down next to this, this guy whose name is Juan Martinez. And we got into a conversation with Juan Martinez from Salinas. And he uh, explained to me that, you know, first of all, I found he had been a bodyguard for Cesar Chavez during the Great Boycott and the Lettuce Boycott and um, was working on a project to uh, make a section of US 101 uh, officially dedicated as the Bracero Memorial Highway. And uh, he asked me, he said, did you know that the victims uh, in the plane wreck um, were mostly Braceros and not undocumented workers? And I said, no, I, I never knew that. I've been playing a song for 50 years and I never knew that. And he says, yeah, yeah. He says, uh, did you know about the accident that happened when there was a makeshift transportation van and, and it exploded and 14 Braceros were killed? And I said, no, I didn't know about that. He said, well, what about the, the time when the train in Gonzales hit a bus with uh, 32 Braceros and they were all killed and dragged down the, the tracks? Did you know about that one? And I said, no, I didn't. He says, that's because nobody wrote a song about that one. But that particular accident is what inspired this man 
to want to dedicate a section of the US 101 as the Bracero Memorial Highway because he was about 10 or 11 years old when his parents came across that train wreck and they were first responders and he never forgot that. And we just got a post from him two, two days ago. The um, supervisors of Monterey County, uh, through the efforts of Juan and, and uh, his, uh, uh, his group of uh, activists that he's organized and works with, uh, officially uh, approved the funding for the Monterey Jail, where Cesar Chavez uh, had been jailed uh, during the boycott, and it's the place where uh, mm -hmm. Coretta Scott King and, and uh, Ethel Kennedy both came to visit him there. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's just uh, an interesting story. He explained to me about the Bracero Project, which I had heard about, uh, which of course is very much connected to, to Tim's work because of the the Bracero Project in 1948, it, it was, it was uh, current. It, it was started in 1942 uh, through 1964, and it was a, a program whereby Mexican workers um, could apply and come to the United States and work in, in the agricultural fields to fill the gap left by um, American uh, farm workers who had gone into the war effort to fight with the Allies. And so, um, I had actually written a song in 1972 uh, because I first moved to this area up near Monsall Valley Center. And workers were coming up my driveway all the time looking for work and people were saying, oh, they should bring back the Bracero Project. It was so great. And it was great for the landowners, but it was not great for the workers. Because, you know, as I just explained, there were so many accidents. But this is a song that I wrote, uh, the beginning of which was in 1972, but I finally finished it a couple years ago. And it's uh, called El Bracero. The paper said to bring the Mexicans in 1942. Men who left the fields for the war And there's too much work to do North came El Bracero To work the fields and grow the food For the troops, the allies and the nation Truly a part of the greatest generation See the sack of potatoes full of tomato See the man bending down with a short handled hoe This is a song for El Bracero Made by the sack of the bushel Well, 
la posa de papa La cesta de tomates Vero hombre agachado con su corto azadón Esta es una canción para el presero Thank you all of you for coming. Have a wonderful week. All they will call you.